Well, he hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Rory Catherine Jones. I'm moderating this event. Three fascinating talks. Uh, we've got about half an hour for a Q&A. I've already had a lot of questions coming in, but feel free to carry on asking them. Uh, but first of all, I'm going to bring in um, York's uh, research champion for health and well-being, uh, Professor Karen Bloor. Um, Karen, I mean, talk about multidisciplinary uh, and a whole picture of the range of research going on at, at, at York. Um, what did you take away from that 45 minutes? Well, that wasn't it. Wasn't it great, Rory? And and um, I, I think the first the first thing I took away from 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 all three of those talks was hope. Really, um, what an optimistic and and heartwarming set of talks they were. I mean, we you know all of them with a really positive message about how we how we can actually make some progress on some of the most challenging um, yeah, aspects of of current society. So you know, fantastic to hear about. Um, algae and not not just the not just I'm, I'm, I'm mind blown by the algae itself but also by the science and the technology and the imaging that that means that Luke and others can can understand that um, it was great to see some of the you know the you know the potential for for some simple but innovative and usable and cost effective technologies to to combat malaria one of the world's biggest killers and um, isn't it isn't it fantastic to think about the the benefits of of computer games? Not just to, you not just think of them as a negative thing. And what a great parallel with reading that was, by the way, Paul. Uh, but but how we can think of those benefits, particularly perhaps at a time like this when we're all facing perhaps more than usual levels of, of stress and anxiety. So so the first thing I take from from all of all of those talks is is, is just hope and positivity. Um, the second thing that I wanted to, to bring in was, um, as you say, interdisciplinarity and, and the benefits of working from different perspectives with different, different people across departments, faculties, um, and indeed a, a across the world, um, and how different perspectives can, can benefit um, any of the research questions that we ask as individuals. So again, looking at looking at Luke's talk on on um, the importance of algae, um, there's a lot of work around the university on um, on on the interaction between health and the environment, um, and indeed on the potential health impacts of climate change. So hopefully, as as Luke and others work progress, we can we can see what the potential value of that of that work and the potential benefits of the research to slow climate change and perhaps the value of information and, and developing um, that research as well. Um, Matt's talk as well um, brought in health and the environment in, it, in its broader sense, not just the sort of natural environment, but also the built environment and the effect that humans have on our own environment and, and, and again, sort of simple changes that can be made. But, but Matt also highlighted the interdisciplinary nature of his project. Um, so I know Matt is working with social scientists, with economists, with modelers, with epidemiologists. That all came across fantastically well in, in, in that talk. And, and Paul on um, the importance of gaming, I thought the, um, you know, the, again, that, that brought, brought across the, the interaction between um, physical health and mental health, and in this case, um, gaming, and some, you know, the, the sort of social connectedness, um, the potential mental health benefits. Um, and indeed, there are physical health benefits too. I've, I've, I've been racking my brains to think of what the name of that that game was that everyone played on their phones for the summer, where everybody was rushing out and about to pick up points. Pokemon you know Go. I mean? Pokemon Go. Yes, that's the one exactly. So you know that one. <laughs> that one showed you how actually the games can get people moving, um, as well as to connect people socially. And um, and also in other parts of the, un the university, there are there is work going on around um, digital games and mental health. So so Lena Geiger in the Department of Health Sciences um, has been working on using games um, to to treat common mental disorders like depression and anxiety in children and adolescents. So um, fantastic set of talks and and a fantastic example of how interdisciplinary research 
can can join together and 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 add to the the, the incredibly important scientific questions that are being asked here. Right. Well, we've got a lot of questions. I'm going to try and chug through quite a few of them. Um, uh, Luke, uh, Luke McIndoe, uh your talk on algae. Um, I've got a. I'm going to bring together two questions here. Uh, why the drop in oxygen levels before plants appeared? Says George. And Tim, in a possibly related question, why do you think plants developed without the uh, algal paranoid? Paranoid. Yes. Um... I hope you can hear and see me okay. Um, yeah, so with the uh, the drop in oxygen levels, uh, I'll go Scott to add, there's a slight caveat here in that our knowledge of uh, exactly exact oxygen levels at the time and exactly when these events occurred, is a, there's a bit of uncertainty. But what I can say is that when you have a lot of uh, plant matter uh, and algal matter, you have a lot of uh, CO2 being fixed and a lot of oxygen being released uh, and then there's also a, a balance of then oxygen being taken up by say uh, bacteria and then releasing CO2 so it's to do with this balance that you can have these changes um, and then the second point about why didn't plants evolve with a, a, an algal pyrenoid this is a, a really interesting question and what we think a lot about but what we, what we do think is that, or what we do know is that when plants evolved, there was a high level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So they probably didn't need this turbocharging mechanism to be able to do photosynthesis really efficiently because there's already enough CO2. And then actually CO2s on a geological timescale, CO2s drop considerably since they evolved. Uh, so that's why we think uh, they didn't evolve with a, a pyrenoid. And a, a couple more questions, again, slightly related. Lydia Ebden, is it realistic to think that algae could break down plastic and recycle it safely? Um, and somebody else says, have you looked into CO2 capture capability of giant kelp in particular? Uh, so related to uh, plastic, I, I do think it's realistic. And there is, there is research in this field, not by my lab, but by, uh, by algal biologists. Um, and they're trying to look for algae and also bacteria, which produce specific enzymes, which can plate, break down plastic. And there are known examples. Uh, so I think this is a this is a possibility in the future. Uh, whether scaling it up to solve some of the problems we're facing uh, with plastic pollution, say in the oceans, uh, I'm uh, unsure about that scaling process. Uh, and the second one, uh, we aren't working with giant kelp, but they, they are amazing algae, which can grow very rapidly and would have a huge potential for absorbing vast amounts of carbon dioxide. So I, I do think there's a, definitely a, a, a lot of potential in that, in that area in using algae for carbon capture. Great. Um, I'll, I'll be coming back to you, Luke, with a few more later, but let's move on to Matthew Thomas uh, and talk about uh, these eaves tubes and combating malaria. So a lot of quite practical questions. Uh, um, uh, Anne Lin Chan, this is so exciting. Just wondering how long is the lifespan uh, of an eave, eave tube? And I'll chuck in another sort of practical question. Um, um, which is um, uh, why uh, uh, this is such an exciting, what needs now to happen to ensure that this simple and cost effective way of reducing malaria gets widely adopted? What's the next stage, I suppose? Yeah, very good questions. <clears throat> so um, these inserts that we used in the Eve tubes, they have this insecticide on them. In our experiment, and this was a sort of a proof of principle, does this approach work? Can this approach work? Combining screening, combining these Eve tubes that, that add, add the, the effect of mortality in addition to the physical barrier. So, so these were still prototypes in a way. And so I think there's a there, so tying those two questions together, in terms of moving forward, there are still challenges in terms of ongoing product development. Within our study, our, the insecticide on those inserts lasted for about four months or so to a cutoff where we monitored them regularly 
And if they failed to kill 80% of mosquitoes on contact, that was our point at which we said we need to switch out the inserts in the villages. So the team would go through the village, take the old inserts out, and you saw the picture where they can be washed and reused, retreated with insecticide and put new inserts back in. So the turnover process is, very, is actually very easy. Um, so with that existing insecticide, with that sort of prototype technology, it was about three to four months. The commercial partners have been working on improving that, and I think they, they have data which suggests it could be six months or 12 months. There are other ways that one could imagine treating an insert using impregnated technologies in the same, the same sort of technologies that are used for developing insecticide impregnated or insecticide coated netting. And those bed nets um, with the impregnation or coating, they can last up to three years. So in principle, we can come up with something that lasts much longer. It's an interesting question in terms of the homeowner as to whether um, there's a value in treating them relatively frequently in terms of maintaining, making sure that not, they're not, for example, covered in cobwebs or you don't have birds nesting in them or something like that. If you put it up there and you don't need to worry about it for three years, you might sort of forget about it. So a bit more frequent might in fact be better in terms of maintaining the technology, even though in terms of cost, putting something up there that lasts for three years might be slightly cheaper. In terms of moving forward more generally, uh, that was a really big trial. Um, but if we want WHO to um, approve this product and to add it officially to the arsenal of, of, of recommended tools, uh, then we need a second big experiment. We need a second randomized controlled trial in another location to demonstrate that our results weren't a one-off, weren't a fluke, that in fact it's repeatable and robust. And so um, the other partners in the project are now currently looking to do work in East Africa so we can complement the work in West Africa, so possibly a study in Tanzania to do another study. And I'll just add in, not wanting to monopolize the talk here, but I noticed one of the other questions that said, um, you know, how, what about the impact of the screening versus the tubes? Why, why don't you just put screening on houses? Well, that's a really interesting question. Yeah, I was going to put that one to you. Sorry. So the, so, the next, so the next study aims to partly address that in, in that we will have an additional arm in the study in that we will have, we will have um, or possibly two arms, depending on the exact study design. Um, but so we'll have a control, we'll have Eve tubes, we'll have screening and we'll have screening plus Eve tubes. So we can partition the, the relative contribution of the component parts. We've done individual household studies that try and look at that. And, in, and indeed, it looks like there is a contribution from both parts. But um, at the moment, the answer is to exactly what technology we want to take forward, we haven't fully answered. And in terms of getting regulatory approval, we need this second big study, if at least we're going to access donor funding like the Global Fund, for example, that supports these big malaria interventions. We could go down the private route of just modifying people's houses without WHO recommendation. And that's something else we're also looking at, looking at the private sector as well as the public sector support. Okay, and I'll come back to you with a couple more detailed questions uh, in a moment. Uh, but let's move to Paul Cairns and talk about um, why games are good for you, which, Paul, I was particularly struck by this because uh, I did a story a couple of weeks ago with a, a research, uh, a study from uh, Oxford uh about people playing games and the apparent beneficial effect on their well-being uh, and it really struck me that there has been an awful lot of uh scare stories to be frank which you you kind of mentioned uh and a lot of talk and we've got one question saying uh, how fast is gaming addiction growing there's been a lot of a lot uh from that point of view it strikes me that there's been very little research uh, of, of, um, of a deep nature into the actual psychological effects of games uh, and a lot built on kind of anecdotal evidence of the whole idea of gaming addiction. Can I ask you, do you think gaming addiction is a real thing? It's a, re it's a really good question and it's quite tricky. Um, Yes, I, th I think gaming addiction is real. I think because you can become addicted to all sorts of activities, you know, people can be 
uh, you know, obviously the, the obvious ones of gambling and alcohol and drugs, they're, they're obviously addictive, but you can be addicted to, you know, dangerous driving, um, you know, immoral behaviors and, and so on. We, we, we can get addicted to anything. And I think in the same sense, games uh, can be addictive and lead to people spending far too much time on them. I think the difference really though, is that with something like alcohol and drugs, you have a, an associated morbidity, it, it kills you. Um, uh, and with gambling, it'll you'll run out of money, and that has you know tremendously bad consequences on you and your your, your loved ones. Typically, I think with games you do get addiction, but what you are seeing also is the fact that people kind of possibly kind of go through it. They go through the addiction. They spend maybe what you might consider excessive amounts of time time gaming, but it's not necessarily killing. Well, it's not killing them, and it's not necessarily even really too harmful because through those games they might be making valuable and useful social connections. So th that notion of addiction and the, you know, the very negative word addiction, which we, you know, we see as a social ill, it doesn't quite apply to this concept of games where it's, it's just not that bad. Um, now it's not to downplay, you know, that there are obviously you know, some cases where it is extremely bad and has led to uh, very bad outcomes for people. Uh, in Korea in particular, people have died through not walking away from a computer game. Uh, for many, but this is 20 plus hours, and actually what they died was kidney failure because they, they just needed a wee and they didn't walk away from the computer. Um, you know, so we're, we're talking, you know, it can happen, but I think in the level at which you might think of, you know, six or seven hours a day, it might be terrible. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's, you know, there probably is a better way to spend your life. I'd be very happy with that, but it's not necessarily killing you. And I think that's, that's is kind there of where it's moral good. panic. I mean, when I was growing up, it was, you spend all your time slouched in front of the telly, go out and do something more useful instead. Exactly, exactly. That's right. And I think there's a, a degree of that as well. You know, you sort of, yeah, the telly's terrible, get away from the telly. And the stuff I found about reading is genuinely true. You know, people said that about reading as well. I don't think any, you know, any parent would be d deeply concerned about their child reading a book for three or four hours, um, mm -hmm. you know, because they see it as a, you know, improving, expanding educational thing to do. And I think games are moving into that territory as well. So they aren't just a waste of time. There are things happening there with games which are exposing you to different world viewpoints uh, and different experiences that you couldn't otherwise have. Maureen Vivas says, interesting presentation. All the game examples that you used allow the user to make progress and achieve things, whether killing aliens or collecting cats. This seems to be an important factor as people often do not have this sense of achievement in the real world. Um, is have you sort of looked at the sort of different structures of games and whether there one can say anything um, uh, about you know the positivity in in in, in that sense of achievement? We're, we're starting to look at that now. Really, what what is it about the games that people are finding uh, positive and valuable? Um, I mean, there is a, a, a theory, a self determination theory, from uh, other parts of psychology, where they they say that games fulfil self-determination because it has these attributes of uh, autonomy you can choose what to do competence you feel a sense of achievement uh, and relationships you can relate to others uh, through games and but these three aspects are independent games they're good for everybody uh, and they motivate us not in normal life and games seem to deliver these so there's that sense of uh, Maureen's question might be correct there that it's the achievement that you get through games is quite rewarding in its own right um, but I think it's it's not that simple as well because some games uh, open world games, the, you can do what you like, the way you like, and there's a game, but you don't have to play it. You, can, you know, I know people who go to open world games and they farm herbs to sell at the local market. It's, I mean, it sounds ridiculous in some sense. Why would you go to a virtual world to do that? Because it's fun and you enjoy it and you get something out of it. Uh, why not? So it's not always the case that people are, if you like, um, goal driven, goal oriented. Sometimes they're just they're just there inhabiting a different world for a different while and getting something out of it. And I think there's value in that as well. Um, so, and we're just starting to unpick this and start to, to develop the language of talking about these different games and what they're trying to deliver. Great. Um, let me just go back to, to Luke uh, and Algi. Um, I've got one more question for you, Luke, uh, and then I've got one of my own. Uh, Margaret Scott, uh, the division of the cells, your film made it look really rapid, but we think of plants as slow. How quick is this division and growth? Yes, yeah, so um, the, the movie I showed you is uh, sped up, um, but cell, uh, algal cell growth is very comparable to, say, cell division, 
in other eukaryotes, so say in uh, mammalian cells, and then sometimes can be very rapid. So cells could divide with some of the quickest algae every two or three hours. Um, and you can see this, say, in like one example, back to the kelp, they're growing uh, say, up to half a meter a day, which is really rapid. So I think cell growth is very comparable. It's just um, uh, a lot of plants, we, we see uh, that they can't, they can't move and they're in a very static position. And so I think that's how we envision plants, uh, but actually their growth rates can be very comparable to other organisms. Um, and I'm, I'm interested in how you begin engaging with people who might take this on further and do those extraordinary things that you sort of posited in terms of climate change. I, I think I might bring Karen in here. Um, are university structures helpful enough at the moment in allowing you to collaborate with others, uh, reach outside the university, um, uh, get, get funding to take things to a sort of implementation level? Are you asking me that one, Rory? Or well, I, 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 I'm, I'm wondering if you've got, well, I, let, let me ask Luke that first and then, okay. and then get your reflections on it. Sure. So uh, uh, I suppose for an example, I suppose where we're most uh, advanced is the potential of engineering this uh, pyranoid, so this turbocharger into plants, uh, which then ultimately we would like to put into crop plants. And so we're still, um, at the, at the stage of testing it out in, in plants and trying to get it to work. And so we use like a model plant, which is very easy to grow and easy for us to engineer. Uh, and so we're trying to get to this proof of concept. And then at this point, we would then probably look more towards uh, industry connect connections. So into uh, agribiotech, uh, which we're getting close to, but we're still, I suppose, just before that. And then maybe Karen could build on onto that. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I think university structures can get in the way, but, but, but at York, we, we try really hard to make sure that doesn't happen. And indeed, and indeed quite the opposite, the research themes. Um, so I've been working on the health and well-being research theme, but there are other themes in environmental sustainability and, and resilience and um, technologies for the future, creativity, culture and communication, um, and risk evidence and decision-making and equality and justice. I hope I've got them all in, I hope I haven't missed any. But um, these themes were designed to make sure that people from different areas of the university can meet each other, can work together, can collaborate and share ideas. And sometimes it's just, you know, sharing ideas over lunch, having a chat, thinking about different ways of viewing things. But sometimes that can go on to, uh, you know, a, a huge multi-million pound um, research grant to, um, you know, maybe we've got social scientists working with physicists on an EPSRC funded grant. And um, we have examples of that. I, I know that um, you know, Paul in computer science works with works with people in in the applied health area and and in psychology. So, you know, we've got these themes across York um, where we we really try hard to make sure that that you know systems like departments and faculties and budgets and and all of that stuff isn't able to get in the way of a good idea. Um, and and um, I, I, I think that's successful. I hope that's successful. Um, and I hope that continues long into the future at York. Matthew Thomas, I'm gonna get you to chime in on that in a moment, but first of all, I'm gonna ask you a, and a couple more sort of factual or one or two more factual questions that have come in. Debs, uh, for Professor Thomas, what is the insecticide and is it safe for humans to be exposed to it and for it to be in the environment, what effects will it have on the beneficial bacterial and beneficial insects in the environment? Those are good questions. So, um, so the, the, the insecticide we used in this experiment was a pyrethroid. So that's the same insecticide that's used on, or one of them that's used on, on bed nets. 
So that is a very long history of testing uh, very low mammalian toxicity, very good at killing insects. Um, so one of the criteria in terms of um, developing this technology and using it is that it has to be safe for humans. It's slightly different to a bed net in that it's, uh, it's in a tube up at eave height. And so in principle, we might be able to use different types of insecticide and different doses of insecticide in an eave tube than we might be able to use on a bed net. But nonetheless, uh, human safety toxicology is a, is a key driver behind product choice. So what we're doing is using, trying to repurpose existing insecticides that are already approved for public health use. In terms of non-target effects, then um, again, that depends a lot on um, sort of how the insecticides are used. These, in, these insecticides will kill many insects, um, but because they're being delivered at eave height in, in the home, then that's a very limited subset of the insects. So it's not going to be butterflies, it's not going to be bees, it's not going to be um, beneficial, other beneficial insects in, in the broader environment. Yeah, um, it's anything that happens to fly into an eave tube or is in and around your house. And in general, most of the things that are living in your house are things that you'd quite like not to be living in your house. So, so the, the, the sort of non-target effects are in fact potentially beneficial. And here's a question. I don't know you'll have the answer to it. Uh, you had a figure of 40% reduction, I think, in, in child malaria. But yep. Ian Hemshaw, what was the reduction in child mortality? Yeah, so we had, um, so we only followed our cohorts of children. And I, I'm just looking at my talk, I think I misspoke. So we had 50 children basically recruited into each study village and we followed them for two years. So 50 times 40. So we monitored about 2,000 children uh, overall. Um, and it, in, in the study, we had um, a total of 12 deaths uh, in, the, in those children, uh, nine in the control arm and three in our treatment arm, um, three due to malaria in the control arm and two due to malaria in the treatment arm. Now, what's interesting about that is that in spite of how our intervention and in spite of monitoring these children, we still had children die of malaria. But it's a relatively low number. That's a tragic number, but it's, it's, it's relatively low. And that's because malaria is treatable. If you can find someone who's sick with the disease, give them drugs, then you can cure the disease. And that's really why the burden of malaria is so awful in that it is preventable and treatable. Nobody needs to die from malaria. We have environments that are perfectly suitable for malaria in many parts of the world, including, I'm sat here in Florida at the moment, Florida's perfect for malaria, heaps of mosquitoes, there is no um, malaria apart from occasional imported cases in the US, and that's because it's a disease of poverty, not just environment, but a disease of poverty. So if you've got good health infrastructure where you can access doctors, you can get diagnosed, you can get the treatment, you can afford the treatment, you can prevent the disease and you can prevent the mortality from the disease rather. So that's why it's a sort of really tragic disease. It's a, it's as it has a huge burden, but nobody needs to get it and nobody needs to die from it. Uh, and you're arriving or not quite arrived at York from the United States. Can I just talk to you about that? Get your take on this collaboration idea and co connectivity to the outside world and to yeah. other things within the university. Absolutely. So it's been really interesting to come in and have that slightly out, out sort of outside perspective. Um, what attracted me to York was um, York's enthusiasm and its mechanisms to support interdisciplinary research. So the so where I'm working, York Environmental Sustainability Institute, its mandate is to help develop, empower interdisciplinary research to address these major environmental sustainability challenges of food, the environment. And one of the things I'm really keen to grow is to strengthen the links between environment and health. So we can have a healthy planet and healthy people. And the solutions to, to that are not going to come from any single discipline. They are going to require multidiscipline and interdisciplinary approaches. So I think that's one of the challenges and one of the changes in universities. We have great historic sort of disciplinary structures of departments of one thing or another colleges of science, colleges of social science, colleges of humanities, um, physics, whatever it is. 
the idea, I think, I think the work that I, why I talked about this, my project or the project that I was involved with is to try and illustrate how you need all of these things to help address those problems. And I think York does that really well. It's, it's, it's why I came or why I'm coming. <laughs> Excellent. Great. Uh, and Paul Cairns, finally, a um, couple of questions. Uh, is there research about behavioural change impact on players of games that promote environmental sustainability? Um, and I'll chuck another one in there while we're there. Paul, how can we increase gender and ethnic diversity in gaming? What's the broader role for universities in supporting better levels of diversity? Yeah. So, so I'll take the first one. The first one's actually a general question about uh, a serious game, what are called serious games. The, the use of games do have if you like real world outcomes so whether that's uh, environmental change behavior change around personal lifestyles you know sort of eating more healthy and so on um there's very i think it's fair to say there's been very little success with that sort of thing uh, to the point where there's actually a term for it in the games industry called recorded broccoli and uh, we know we would like children to eat broccoli because uh, it's good for them, but they don't like it, know that, and they don't eat chocolate coated broccoli. Um, sorry, I'm getting a signal that my, my signal is unstable, so I'm sorry if I cut out. Um, the, um, the, so serious games, you know, you try to dress up a serious point as a game, and people are wise to it. They, they, see, they see the serious point underneath the game. And actually, interestingly, some work that I did with, uh, well, he's now a colleague, but a, a former PhD student, David Sendel, for his PhD, um, he was looking at, um, you know, how do these sort of metaphors, these ideas inside games become real for people so that they, if you like, process them consciously. And the answer is, if it's, if it's not relevant to the game, if it's just a window dressing, if you like, you know, this game's about environmental uh, uh, sustainability, but all you're doing is shooting trees instead of soldiers, it, it, it doesn't work. Uh, you, you, your brain just doesn't process it at that level. You've got to build a game which in some house is about the thing that you want to, to learn or, or to achieve. And that's really difficult. That's a very challenging thing. So I think it may be possible, but I think you've got to have, you've got to be both a, a brilliant game designer and, and uh, have a, a very clear goal that is tailored towards a game. It's, we're, we're a long way from changing schools into um, penny arcades, if you, if you think of it that way. Um, in terms of inclusion and diversity within the games industry, it is uh, very much dominated by uh, men. Uh, and uh, predominantly white men, uh, people like me. Um, and that's a problem. Uh, it's, it is a, a challenge for the industry, but I think it is one that the industry has woken up to and is, and is, is wise to. Um, there's a lot of efforts uh, to get uh, women more involved in, in games and uh, development in particular. Um, and I think that sort of goes alongside a lot of efforts, including here at York, to get women more involved in computer science generally. Um, it is from computer science that a lot of uh, games developers come, uh, and we need to think about that. And in some ways, though, the problem is that um, behind, you know, at the point at which we're getting sort of people to come to computer science, we're already getting a gender imbalance in the applicants towards games related degrees uh, and computer science. So in some sense, if you like the gender imbalance in particular is happening earlier in their education, uh, if people are feeling they can't do computer science. Uh, you know, it's a it's a, a boys' discipline rather than a girls' discipline. Worse. As far as I can see, the figures I've seen, um, the irony about upskilling the computer science education in in secondary schools is that fewer girls are actually doing it. Yeah, and you know, there's a lot of efforts in the sort of the computer at schools, uh, computing at schools uh, project. You know, which we've been heavily involved with at York. You know, we're trying to get. Uh, that message across early on that it's you know it's for everyone everyone can do it uh, it's not just a boys discipline but these you know these are cultural changes which are hard to bring about uh, you know across it's across all levels of society and through schooling um, schools are you know schools are supportive uh, universities are supportive but it's a, it's a hard change to make uh, and we're, but we are trying and and I'd like to say at the University of York we do quite well we do have one of the better gender ratios of, of computer science departments, but I'll be very clear, we're a long way from 50-50 uh, in terms of the gender balance. Um, but, you know, we're trying hard. Great. Well, we're running out of time. I just want to bring Karen in uh, right at the end for just a, a few reflections on, on, on what we've heard. Um, and it does come back to that, that sort of cross-fertilization idea, doesn't it? 
Yeah, absolutely. I think it's 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 great to have heard um, Matthew's view, and 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 I'm really pleased that 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 York's um, efforts to um, you know maintain and and indeed increase our interdisciplinarity have, have encouraged someone like Matthew to come and join us at York. So that's fantastic news. Um, but I think all of our all of our speakers today have have shown the benefits of working across disciplines, of having a really strong disciplinary focus yourself, but but working with others um, to to share ideas and to um, and to develop new perspectives. And and as I said at the beginning, the 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 um, the positive the positive message from all of these talks is that some of the bigger societal problems, climate change tropical diseases and and indeed mental health and social isolation can all be um, progressed by um, by research like like the the projects that have been reported today and all can be progressed more and faster if we work together across disciplines well thanks Karen uh, also thank you also to Luke Mackinder Matthew Thomas and Paul Cairns uh, thank you for uh, for joining in. I know there are hundreds, probably thousands of you out there. You've been a great audience, ask great questions. Uh, I've got to go and put some bread in the oven. So, you know, I've got to wrap this up. Um, don't forget, there are more sessions uh, throughout the day. There's another one coming up. Uh, do join that one. But thank you very much uh, for being here. Uh, and thank you to our panel. Thanks. <laughs>